Nehemiah. Happy anniversary. Um, almost like I guess four years, if you count our first little bit of Mountain Time Team Kelly and 2017. I guess that counts, even though we had like a little bit of a break. But our anniversary is coming up when we officially got together. Well, more like settled and really got serious about it. Um, I really wish you were here and you would be able to see this video, but also at the exact same time. It wouldn't be so sad either. So, if you somehow watch this or hear me talk, um, happy anniversary today. I really wish this would be more happier than what it is. And for those that will watch it, I'm very, very sorry for this long, long movie, but it's our life to get our whole story, so it's mostly just for me, but for those who want to hear our story, um, I really wish you were here, Daniel, to, to celebrate this with me, tonight as a ghost, and probably celebrating at your grave before everything, so. Probably get this emotional roller coaster going. We had met at Scream Again. It was close our first year there back in 2017. So you swore you had never seen me at actors training, but I've always seen you. I mean, Scott Hardeman is a big giant. So, but I didn't really participate a lot into the, like, group stuff because I was trying out for makeup. Um, we both had been through a lot and wasn't looking to find love at all. So we were very, like, guarded. And we really didn't actually got to know each other or even like met until I became your makeup artist and that's when you start telling everybody that I fell in love with putting blood on you. Oh, the memories you used to, you were like the very first guy there or and girl that would never had hit on me or call me baby or sweetie and all that stuff. You actually talk to me like a decent person and that's really I guess what attracts me. <laughs> um, I really did thought you were cute and stuff. I also thought you were a lot older. It's, I'm not a year younger than my sister but you definitely were way more mature than your age. Um, so we, we talked a lot and he used to leave your jacket with me at Scoob and get in because I would stay at night after everything is done to wait on my mother when she got done acting. So I actually hanged around the midway and got to watch you act and really got to see you enjoy what you loved, which was being the butcher and scaring people so much. And... That really what got me loving and liking you. I didn't say love at first sight, but I definitely was very attracted to you and loved um, your strength that you had. I also remember you had taken a night off at Scream and Gannon, like a work night. And after uh, I got done doing makeup, you, Vanessa, and a couple other people had invited me to come with you guys to the houses. So I did. So I got to hang out with y'all. So that was like 
super cool to me. It really was. Um, so towards the end of Scream the Garden, we have gardens who know each other a lot. Just, you know, the normal everyday stuff, our similarities and our differences. Nothing too personal yet. But definitely by the end of the season, we were flirting and just talking all the time. I was going through a very hardship. I was homeless at the time and living like house to house and hotels and all that. And I was in between jobs. And it was a hard time for me. So you were definitely kind of there. So you were just got out of an abusive relationship too, so we were kind of there for each other. Um, we mostly, um, we're just getting to know each other then. We hanged out a couple of times. Um, apparently we were a couple and I didn't know about it because you were great at communicating. Um, everybody knew we were a couple. And I didn't find out until um, they didn't our screaming at and cookout is when I found out from our mutual friend that <laughs> we were dating. <laughs> so that was great. So I was very happy, to be honest. Some of the clothes that I was wearing was a little out of my comfort zone, like showing my back with lace and different things. So I definitely was dressing to get your attention. <laughs> and I never do that. I've never done that before, but for some reason I did for you. And you didn't even probably even notice. And I definitely try to do that in more outgoing and try to be in the front of the crowd just for you to notice me. <laughs> um after almost two months of flirting and kind of dating, I guess if you consider hanging and watching movies in your room was a date. Um, you had said you loved me, and I was definitely taken by surprise by that. And you gave me a soft, soft kiss on my cheek and sent me off on my way home. And I definitely was surprised all out of response. I was like, yeah, I love you too. And it just came naturally, I guess. You really felt safe to me. I felt very, very, very safe in your arms. And I was so happy, so happy, even for those two months. And you definitely played hard to get my <laughs> You were playing hard to get. Um, but somebody nicknamed the devil or the demon, whatever you want to call her, um, was kind of of a friend from elementary school, like a friend ish. Well, she was friends with a friend from elementary school, which I'm not even friends with anymore, and she caused a lot of problems. She got in our way and manipulated and controlled you, which probably was your stupid mistake in the first place. But she definitely put a strain, so we, we broke up. And the only reason why she was doing that was apparently she had a crush on me and wanted to date me, and I didn't know about it till you had said something. So that's why she did all that, including abusing you. And I'm very, very sorry for that. And I have such bad PTSD from it. So definitely when we got back together was definitely a very trust building because I was always afraid something like that was going to happen again. But so I just never fought and just Say, forget it. If you want to be with somebody, don't be somebody without somebody else. It's whatever, you know. It's cool. So, for six months, 
We were subjected to her bullying ways and misery for six months, which I feel horrible after finding that all out, but it wasn't my fault. It was your fault for letting me go, your fault for everything. For six months, I had tried to date and see other people, but they were never you. I even gone as far as almost going to New Jersey to see somebody if I was thankful that flight got canceled three times because <laughs> who knows where that would have ended up. I might have been dead. Who knows? Um, had always, always hoped that you would come around and talk to me. And at first, the two months after we broken up, you kind of would talk to me here and there. Or at least look at my stuff. And I never knew you saved my photos. That, like, the photo of me and Cassandra at the fire pit and other stuff like that. Like, I never knew you saved all that stuff and kept it there. And so after you had passed away and I looked at your phone, I saw that you still have those photos. You've always had them. So... It was always meant to be. Um, I've always wanted, wanted you. And none of the people I've dated were you. They weren't, not even the people I was talking to. And you were always on the back of my mind. Always. Even in dreams. I've, you were always there. You, you were there. You were the one. Like, I could not stop thinking about you. Even though I had to stop, like, talking about you and move on, I could not stop. You were on the back of my mind. And I always compare people to you. Oh, wait. And I'm so glad it never worked out with anything because you were truly, truly my person. So, about six months later, uh, day in May, I got into a car, car accident, and that's when you had talked to me. Like, you had messaged me either the first day or a couple of days into my new job after having that car accident. You messaged me, and you said that you were sorry and it was a it was a long message but basically you were sorry and that you wish you had never broken up with me and you wish you never had let somebody talk to you out of it and manipulated you. And for to be honest, I left I didn't even touch that message. <laughs> I could have brought myself to it. And Eventually, I did. I did read it, and I responded back because I really wanted to know what you had to say, but also I wanted to see how truthful and sorry you really were. But I was also so freaking happy that you had messaged me and that you were reaching out and that you apologized. And then you had told me that you were done dating that person. You broke up with the help of your friends, which thankfully they helped you with. I was so happy, but sad at the same time, and you hurt my freaking feelings. But I was so happy that you came back to my life. People, I talked to a few friends about it, and they're like, no, 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 don't read it, don't respond back. But... I had a feeling in my heart to respond back, so I did, and it was very heartfelt. It really was, and you confessed your love, too, at the same time with it while saying you were sorry, and didn't realize how much I have meant to you until we had that six-month breakup, and you really, truly did love me. It had taken me, like, an hour to respond back and really, like, talk, talk to you, but I'm so grateful that I did, so grateful. To be honest, you had asked if we can hang out because you really want to meet me in person and really express how much you are sorry, and so I didn't know if I really wanted to see you or not because I 
more than to punch your face for a while, and, and then you said that you're sorry, with apologies, but it was like so confusing, and I you know I was so not to you, I still went and met up with you. We went to the park, and we were there for a while, we just spilled our guts out. We were talking, we talked about everything, what we've been through, um, from past to present, like, we talked, definitely talked it out, and it was very, a heartfelt moment that I've never had with anybody else before either, and I doubt you have had that too many experiences, especially with basically a stranger at that point. That day, we pretty much knew all, everything about each other, almost. Almost. That day, we had decided that we wanted to try again. So we became a couple. But we had agreed that we wasn't going to tell the world about it except for a few close, really close friends. Or maybe it was just me. But you, you had wanted to wait because of the relationship you just got out of and you were just so scared of what people would have said. Um, Especially when Krista has made my life hell a few times, so I totally understand now why you want to keep this secret for a couple months, but I was really, really happy when we finally did open up to the world. Well, it was a secret for a couple months, but I understood. I really did. On May 20th, 2018, we got back together, and it was the most amazing day ever, even though we just talked and walked around the park, but it made my heart truly, truly, truly happy. Hello, drive. I finally have my own cup here. <laughs> it's like, no, I, I finally have my own cup. What is a turtle's cup? Oh, turtle's cup. I said I finally have my own cup. That one's because you turned 21. I can feel it. I can feel it, basically. So. Sparkling apple juice. That help me right now. I remember you trying to convince me to move with you for our first two months of real dating because you were trying to tell a police officer that I could enjoy you. It was something that you had really wanted. You didn't want to leave me behind and wanted me to be with you by your side. I truly believe it was our destiny that brought us back together. Everything clicked and worked together. It was a whole new energy we had never experienced before. We were destined and was meant to be. We were purposely made to be with each other. More than a soulmate. More than a twin flame. It's hard to explain, but we were each other's whole world. By October, we had taken a huge jump in the unmoved hands out, oh, my mom, sister, and I help, but also act as our protector from our landlord because he was starting to get creepy and ridiculous. By then, we were already telling people we were engaged. <laughs> you had given me a promise ring, well, made me pick my own, made me take my own out for my birthday. Not too much after that we were saying we were engaged. To be honest, we already talked about marriage in our future after two months. To others, it may have seemed fast, but to us it didn't. It had felt right, and seemed like the right timing. Even though I had to wait a year later for a real proposal, but I was fine with it. We were truly in love with each other, and to be honest, I probably didn't even need a proposal. But it was nice to finally have it after a year later. We had so many adventures together. We had truly taken time to get to know each other. We had fights, but we were learning to live with each other. We learned how to live with each other, but also what made one sick. 
You were the only thing I had knew. You were truly my best friend. You knew more about me more than my own best friend. They were some, there were some things you didn't know about my past, but like, I didn't know about you either because you were very secretive about some things, which I totally understand because a lot had happened in your life and I know there's still Most people didn't know we had gotten pregnant before college. It was before my sister had gotten pregnant and found out. Maybe we had too many drunk nights in the tent in the woods and being by the bonfire and just talking. But I wouldn't want that with anyone else, so we were we were scared as hell of anybody. I had taken five tests and we're all staying positive for two months and I even missed my period. I never had a period at all and I had signs. I had so many signs and just felt pregnant. We even heard a heartbeat, too. A very, very small, faint heartbeat. My doctor thought it was crazy and refused to test me or send me to an OB. We only told a very, very few people. I remember those two months feeling so guilty and I was just always apologizing to you. Like, always writing apology letters while you were at work and how sorry I was for being pregnant and thought you were mad. To be honest, I really thought you were mad that somehow, you know, things happened. We had, I guess, pregnancy care. But I know you were just scared. I know, and so was I. I've never had a pregnancy scare before, and I never really was like, never hold around or anything, so it was really, truly very, something new to me. Um, a lot of, the few people that we did tell kind of made me feel crazy anyways, and nobody really believed me, even if believed about the miscarriage, but it's okay. You were the only one that really believed me, except for my sister and a couple, maybe a couple other people, but no. I can talk about it before it was very painful and I never opened up to anybody about it and being friends with my friend Jeannie has helped me a lot with that too. After three months have gone by, I had a blood bath, a very, very heavy period and it was painful and then I'm finding out that it was a miscarriage and my doctor still never believed me and refuse to even send me to an OB to get checked out or even get tested. So it's okay. It's okay. I know deep down what happened. But you were there for me for all of it. You were so supportive. And then after that night, we really talked. And we really were very sad and truly we really had wanted to be pregnant and have a baby. But we knew it wasn't the right time. But we were very, 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 very sad and we had, had a depression about it. So, we named her Jasmine, Celeste Gonzalez. Her mom had always wanted a girl named Jasmine and you promised her that you would give her a girl and her first name will be Jasmine. We were very first girls. So that's what we did. Throughout the time, I've cried on and off for the whole pregnancy with my sister and I feel so bad that I was never really supported with her or with my father because he was pregnant too at the same time with my stepmother. I felt alone and nobody really was there but you and it was very, very, very hard for me. 
And it was hard to see family friends go through pregnancies and watch their kids grow. And we never, never could. So my niece is definitely our, our child, like a daughter to us. As time went on, we got more and more serious, and we became managers for swimming gun. And you were the ones who were midway manager, and I was a costume manager. I stepped out of makeup and went into costuming. Costuming. We had to keep things professionally while we were there, even though off the clock, too. Even with off the clock, we had to keep things professionally, which we were really good at. It was weird to call you by your first name and not being able to compliment you. Um, had to wait till we got home for all that, but it was okay. We both had put so many hours into screaming again, and it was definitely ours in a way. We definitely helped a lot of people out while we were there. We gave home all of us. We gave screaming again in our soul, <laughs> and we were managers for a while. We really were. It wasn't. It wasn't for screaming again, and we. We would never be here, so I'm very grateful for screaming. You. We gotta wait for this to pass. Okay. You had so many passions. You always wanted to be a party planner, a detective, a barber, and so much more. You had wanted to make this place a better place for everyone. We were going to open up our own animal sanctuary once we got some property. We were going to rescue a lot of animals. He definitely wanted to rescue lynxes and wolves. And I was down for it. I was going to get my license. I was going to study for all that. I love animals. Why not, right? Especially we got to see, get to save a lot of them and rehabi re rehabilitate, um, help them get better and then release them back in the wild if possible. We were going to have our own mall where everything that we like to do and can do because we were definitely jack of all trades. For example, we were going to have a barber and salon, a restaurant, a metaphysical shop, arcade, and much, much, much more. I would be lucky to own a salon. Oh. To be honest, I hope one day I can own a salon so I can name it after you. So hopefully, I can still be able to do that since I don't have you anymore. As time went by, we had so many adventures together. We were trying to see the world together. We tried going to different places whenever we can, but our favorite place was home. Watching TV while being in each other's arms. We could be homeless, and as long as we have each other, and I was in your arms, I was home. But now without you, your arms, I have no home to go to. The home I have is just empty. There's no you with know me without you. I definitely need you more than I thought I ever did. And I think I rely on you way too much, but I know you had relied on me a lot too. You, you were my safe haven. By the end of Scream 2019, you had finally proposed to me. That slapped though. So enjoy the video. After three seasons of Fumageddon, I know it's been tiring and very annoying sometimes. I want to do, I want to do Fumageddon with you more years. Will you marry me? Yeah. <laughs>
For the record, I said no. <laughs> we kept trying to expand our family besides having fur kids. We probably had about six almost pregnancies. We went through a lot. Once we got it was our time, but it ended up failing. By December 2019, we had succeeded. To be honest, we fully gave up and was focusing on trying to get a house and getting our life situated and financially stable. But we wind up pregnant. I was super sick and half quiet. I had taken like five tests at 5 a.m. one day just to see if I really was pregnant. I cried so bad because I was so happy and you were so confused on what was going on. But you stood up. Well, you woke up at 5 and stood up with me so I can take that test and you thought that we miscarried, but I didn't understand we were pregnant and showed it to you. And we cried for probably about an hour or two, and then we fell back to sleep. My doctor never believed us, and we saved for a pee test, and they were trying to say that I wasn't pregnant, so took a blood test and an ultrasound, which they didn't really want to believe me, but she was mad. My doctor was very mad when she found out that we weren't lying, and it was all positive. There was a little baby there. Regardless, it was our time. It was. Throughout the pregnancy, we had lost some friends and some family, but we always had each other. We didn't care what the gender was. We really didn't. We were just happy to be ha have a baby. We were blessed with our rainbow baby. One night, we stayed up all night long picking out baby names for our new bundle, but for our other kids as well. All five of them. Well, we did, I guess if you could just ask them, it'd probably be about five. We chose unusual names, but we wanted it to be very unusual and be like us, so. So, for our new bundle of joy, that we never knew the gender of was named Talatai Gonzalez. We had wanted to bring back our roots, so, so we did. Let me tell you all the names of our five kids that we chosen. Jasmine Celeste Gonzalez, Talatai Gonzalez, Zachariah James Gonzalez, Constantine Felix Gonzalez, and Avalon Bastat Gonzalez. Yes, they may be different, but we want them, wanted them to reflect our heritage and beliefs. We are both mixed of different cultures. We also study and practice those beliefs. We call ourselves shamans, but to be honest, it goes more than that. We have, so, we're mixed. We're, we're a mix. We have so much different cultures in us, including Native American, Irish, Scottish, English. So our kids will be mixed blood with everything. I guess you want to label us and call us a shaman, call us a witch, call us free-spirited, call us whatever, but we know who we truly are. Because we never fit in one box. We do believe in a god, but we also believe in a goddess. We believe in crystals, we believe in my spirit, we believe in all different kinds of gods and goddesses. We believed in everything. And we truly, truly probably have like all different cultures <laughs> coming through at once. So, we don't want to please anybody. So we wanted to raise our kids the way we want to and be just like us. We were, fa we were spiritual, but don't have a religion. And I will continue to do that with Hal, and I hope Jasmine, as the Spirit, watches me. And her father, my husband, Daniel, teaches her as it goes to, because he is truly a spirit guide for Hal, and I know it, and he sees him all the time. We have gotten a lot of help by our family friends for Hal's name, but we never change it. 
I did went through a depression over it, and it freaked me out, but Daniel reassured me. So Tal's name was very perfect. And we did try looking for other names, but nothing worked out. So it was perfect. It really was. And nobody else needed to love it. And Daniel helped me with that. So I'm truly grateful that we kept with with his name. Pregnancy did push buttons, but, you know, hormones. And I've never been so salty or want to fight people in my life. So I was very ready to fight people while I was pregnant. And definitely, uh, definitely brought new emotions out. And Daniel had me thought about having five kids, not going to lie, because he didn't know if he could put up with my salty ass. So, but he sticked through it. He didn't when I tried to do everything myself because I was raised to be independent and not let a man do everything for me. So now I wish that I let him help me a lot more since I didn't know at that time it would have been our first and last pregnancy. So I definitely wish I had helped have him help me a lot more. Um, I'm definitely, truly, I'm sorry for all, all or any problems that I caused, and I know I've had a lot of tantrums too, and I'm really sorry, babe, for all of that. I definitely got think back a whole lot of the good and the bad, especially when I was, like, very hard-headed and a little stubborn. Okay, stubborn. I was not a little, I was stubborn. But, pregnancy for you. <laughs> All new emotions for me that I've never felt before. Even jealousy, I've never felt before until I was pregnant. Um, I really do wish I had leaned up on to you a lot more. By September 2020, we were having our, our little boy. I swore up and down that he would have was supposed that came at the end of August, according to my period cycle. But doctors don't like to believe you worth it anything. If they know your body more than you. But he did came a week before his due date, thankfully, because if not he probably would have died just saying. I was only in labor for barely Five hours. It rushed me to the ER, well, to the hospital, and he. I felt so bad because he literally just got off work too, and he works like 13, 14 hour days, so it was already late for him, like it is when I had went. But he was sleeping while holding my hand through all of it, and then when it was really time to push, he woke up really quick and had super super energy and helped me through it. So I was very grateful to be able to hold his hand and for him to be there for it. Now it was during COVID time, so it was only him and I allowed there. And I wouldn't want anybody else by my side but him. So I'm very, very grateful it's just us two. <laughs> birth without medications or anything, so I'm very proud of myself, but I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. So, I'm very, very grateful. We were very happy to have Paula when he was born. We were on Sky 9, and that's when we were to go to sleep because I was up all night. Like I said, he got home, like, at 11, 30, 12 o'clock from work. From being there since eight o'clock, and we didn't get to the hospital until one o'clock. So we were up until six o'clock, and then six o'clock is when was really the time to like start pushing. So I definitely went very fast.
We had to blow up every moment with Paolo. He was everything that we had wanted. And finally, her back. We did suffer postpartum depression, mixed with our usual depression and anxiety. We didn't know that the partner can get postpartum depression too, not just, you know, the one that just flushed out a baby out, out of her. Um, so we definitely had a different low in our relationship, but we powered through it and we, we talked it out and we were working on it, but also working on the new life of having a baby because that definitely puts a damper on a relationship sometimes, especially when somebody, Daniel, is so used to having all the attention. <laughs> definitely. Definitely a learning curve for both of us and juggling and balancing it all out. That first half of the year had really um, challenged us, but it changed us. But we loved each other so much and that we just kept growing and tried working it out and definitely learned to communicate a lot more. It took us a little bit, but we learned that we needed to communicate. We learned way more things about each other. and. We were working on the new us, I guess. Well, like, the parent us. Because we've never been parents before. So it was the parent us. And we definitely, definitely learned a lot. But we were figuring it out. So that was the job, the baby, our relationship, our relationships with family and friends. We were definitely... Every couple goes through that. Every couple does. We may not have been married, but legally... Let me rephrase that. We may not, not we may not have been married legally yet, but spiritually we were already husband. We have grew to be husband and wife since day one. It was our destiny. It really truly was. And I wish I could make a real movie out of it. <laughs> I wish. We loved every moment of having our babies out and all of our family. We finally was a family and we had that family we were Searching for him for our whole entire life because we both came from families that were broken and didn't care about each other and that family. You never got that fa- real true family. Suffer with the family you made with friends. Um, blood does not make your family, but we finally had our perfect family that we wanted. Perfect in our own little way, to be honest. Our own creepy little way. We were a scary family who loved Halloween. If we could have been paid as vloggers, we would have stayed home all the time. Like, that was, that was our dream, is to be able to, like, work from home so we can spend as much time with each other and be there with for the baby. They don't got to miss out a lot of stuff from Tala that he had done. Luckily, I was trying to record everything, or we just went up to his work a lot because we were allowed there. But he worked so much just to provide for us, and I'm very, very grateful for it. And I always felt really bad not being able to contribute, but I know being a mother and taking care of child helps. And I did go to work a lot. I mean, I did went to work the next day after giving birth, so I definitely told it help holding together. We did took Pala. We did we had taken Pala on a lot of adventures with us too. We wanted him to see the world in what more perfect way it is to as a newborn. But we also made sure we stayed safe and followed all the rules and the protocols because of COVID. And it was truly was amazing and I really do miss all of our adventures and all the time we have together. Like, like I miss that. There's so much memories and not enough times to even, like, talk about it in a video, especially with a already long video. So I'm truly glad that I got photos and videos of a lot of our time together from when I wish we saw the photos from when we first got together back in 2017, but I'm happy for the ones that I did got when we did start all over again and really hunker down. 
I'm very glad I have all this. So it's how I can have it one day too. And when I'm old and lonely, I still can look back at it. I still do. Constantly. Lobo. Tala. Tala, look. Are you a big boy? It's a dare. You a big boy? Are you a big boy? What are you doing? What are you doing? Say hi, mommy. Say hi, mommy. I miss you. Here comes the sad part of our story. And I'm going to try not to cry while talking about it. Almost a year later, after Tala's birth, well, like two weeks before Tala turned one, Daniel had passed away. He didn't even make it to Tala's first birthday. At the beginning of August, Daniel had an allergic reaction to our yard after mowing. Two days later, he wasn't feeling too good still. Tala had a fever from teething that would not break. I was so scared, like, extremely scared and worried that I remember I used to. I used to have a lot of tantrums over it, I guess, because I was just so overwhelmed, because I've never had them both sick at the same time, so trying to breastfeed on top of that was very, very, very scary and hard. Plus, taking care of the damn dog. So, after two days of Tala, fever not going down, and Dan was still feeling very sick. Mostly just a stuffy nose, and he had a little fever, but he's always naturally hot anyways, and he always runs a high temp, so lovely, really, in our house is crappy, because we have a crappy little home, and don't really have AC, just window against all the way room. How cool it down, so um Daniel kept reassuring me while having tantrums and hugging me that they're gonna survive and everything's gonna be fine. And the little we know that it wasn't going to be fine. Um so we went to the ER. How got just um got in sooner than Daniel because he was a baby. So they allow him to go back there and it really help with the, you know, his fever. And he was tested. Everything he got negative, but they said that just in case, you know, wouldn't want to, um, be quarantined and all that. So we did. I wasn't allowed to stay there with Daniel because there was already overcrowded. And it would have been a very long wait, which it was, because Daniel waited six hours before me and Steve. Um, so I went home with the baby and waited for him to let me know when he got out, when he was ready. So I went and came and got him. He ended up being diagnosed with COVID, which we really sure got that from work, um, the place that we were doing the haunted house that because there's other people there that had COVID, so I'm pretty sure that that's where he got it from. Baby and I ended up getting it with my mom. Thankfully we survived, but I wish I've kept let me just keep going with the story. Um we were never told about antibodies or that he could have gotten them before he left or came back and you know the next day. Nobody said anything, and he was only prescribed cough medicine. Well, we didn't know that you were supposed to lay down. You have to sit up for it. Like, there's a lot of things we never knew about at the time until after he got put in the hospital for the second time until we really learned a lot of the stuff. So he went in. Last Saturday, we went to the ER, so by Tuesday, he was still very 
um, sleepy. Like, he was just very, 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 very tired. And he is asthmatic, too, and overweight. So he was able to breathe better when, when he laid on his stomach, which is what he liked to do. But I didn't know he wasn't supposed to sleep all the time on his, on his back. And so, um, Tuesday night, he was starting to lose his breath because he was on his back and wasn't popped up all the way like he should have. And so, I got scared. Tala accidentally stepped on his stomach, trying to get into position to go to bed and breastfeed. So it scared Daniel half to it scared Daniel and woke him up. So that's why I ended up taking him. But, by the time I got to the hospital, which I was close to us, the shittiest hospital ever. Should have known better. I've known the stuff that goes on there and what it's known for. He was actually feeling better with able to breathe, so I should have taken him to a better hospital. I should have. I, to be honest, I don't even remember if I even gave him a hug. Orcus goodbye before I, the nurses took him away inside the ER and I, and it bothers me so bad. But I've always kept texting him and I've always FaceTimed him for the first week. Well, within like two, three days, he was talking about how they were drugging him and stuff, and to be honest, just giving him Advil, he thinks you're drugging him. But he was very dyslexic, and he's never been dyslexic before. He was mixing up his words, he couldn't spell right. Like he definitely went. He he changed. They were giving him a lot of medication. Um, but the whole entire time, he kept promising that. He's going to get better, and that he was going to come home. He was so positive about it. He even talked about how he was going to do everything the nurses said, and he's going to do better, and he's going to try his best. And he talked about how he's going to survive and everything, but then. But once those drugs started coming in, and they were like, oh, they were doubling his medication. Um, he was there for a month, a month of health. Um, he was in ICU, first ER, then ICU. His medicine was being doubled. He was around seven ten medicine, depending on what was going on and stuff. So sometimes he might have seven medications, sometimes he might have had five. He was on a lot of IV bags too. He was given seizure medicine, I think mostly from when he was on the ventilator, but he wasn't got put on the ventilator until a little bit later. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, he wasn't able to go pee at all, I don't even didn't even see a clock moving back, but that could have been hidden. Who knows? He wasn't being allowed to move around or sit up or anything like most people do, because I have nurse clients and nurse family and friends, so I know how. They, and they were telling me, "Well, it's supposed to be being done," which I should have just let them take it over, especially my one aunt, um, especially because they weren't communicating at all, and I kept getting hanged up on and ignored. His feet were, he was too long for the bed, so his feet were, had lost, his legs did lost blood circulation because they were being massaged and they were hanging over it. Um, they were supposed to have FaceTime me, but weren't FaceTime me when I had schedule to be FaceTime, especially when he wasn't able to do it himself anymore. Um, he had sent me so many messages about being lonely and stuff, and that killed me really bad. And I wasn't even allowed up there. 
which was the worst part. All of that happening. And not being able to be there. Even on FaceTime, really, when he had the energy to FaceTime. It was so hard to do that. And Tyler did see him with the mask because he was on his CPAP machine. And he was getting better. He really was. There was a point where he only needed like three more um, numbers before he was able to go home with his oxygen. It was almost there. Like he could have came home. But they had those on, that, on high study too. And because of all that, and not given iron medicine, like I told him that he has no iron. He was able to drink protein shakes, and that's all he really ate until they just stopped and tried to do feeding to him. He eventually had kidney failure. They did put him on a ventilator, and they had for plastine. His ventilator studies were like set. All the studies on there were set to the highest as possibly could. They were given a little extra on the dialysis. They did make sure that he got dialysis first before anybody else, but at that point, he, uh, for about a month here, he had so much medication and all of it was being doubled that it, all the signs were overdose, but they blamed it all on COVID. Which I truly do believe it wasn't COVID that killed him. I truly believe that the the hospital staff, the nurses, are the ones that killed him. Um, the nurses did convince him to go on the ventilator and tell him that they, if he wanted to survive and see Tyler and I, that he needs to get on the ventilator, knowing that he really wasn't. Like, he didn't have his right mind yet, so, like, they be made him become a vegetable. They did. And at the time, I was very grateful and thankful for all that, but now, now I'm like, this is bullshit. Especially talking to a lot of my clients that are nurses and are retired and all that, and figuring out, finding out that it was, like, overdose and just malpr malpractice, and that a lot of the COVID patients that do die, it's because of it, like, plus they get a paycheck out of it. That was the first thing that was listed, that he died with COVID. Even though they claimed that he had pneumonia, but it wasn't really even listed anyway. Um, he was given a lot of seizure medicine while being on the ventilator, which I guess, um, this protocol, I guess, will do with the ventilator, which is really stupid, but they were probably doubling that, too. Um, we didn't even know about the doubling of the medications or giving the a little extra until after he died, well, it was pretty much on his deathbed. We, on August 29th, we got the call that we had to go up there. And that she thought it was the best thing to do, and that he was declining. He ended up having blood in his stomach, which is another sign of overdosing. He could not breathe, get air into the lower part of his lungs, which could have been from the, which was from the ventilator. Um being blasted because they had a ventilator studies on high levels so it busted everything. He even almost lost his eyeballs. Like he was like barely a half inch or inch away of losing them. Um for five hours, Daniel's mom, his oldest brother and I had sat there and watched him die. For five hours, we watched it. Thanks. 
He begs and prayed that he would have survived. And we were told even if he survived, that he was still good a vegetable. And that when her son said that she doubled and was given him extra medication to hope that it will help him heal faster because of his weight and size, which is not right at all. Um, he had blood coming out of his ventilator, which was super thick, like if you added flour to it, which is a sign of overdosing. They just gave him anything and everything to try to save him. And I truly believe that is what killed him. And, and I guess it's just a big experiment. That's how it is for all COVID patients. They just experiment and kill them all. Um, there, there was about eight to ten other patients that day that died at the same time as Daniel did. So almost this whole entire IC floor had died around the same time, supposedly of COVID. Coincidentally. Um, they, there was a family of four, and they were all being told that the other ones survived when they did it, they died. And then the last family member died thinking that her parents and her brother had survived. And that's like the most saddest thing ever to me. And I did try to see about getting him switched and transferred, but they wouldn't allow it either, even when he was, that was when he was a lot better. He almost came home. Almost. He died two weeks before my, let me refer his. He died two days before my birthday, two weeks before Tyler turned one, and two months before we had our official wedding. Um, we sucked because I never got the wedding that we were planning and dreamed of. So I hate seeing other people having the wedding that I wanted, but at the same time, I'm happy my friends are getting married, but it's very hard on me to see it too, because I'll never get that. And I never want it with anybody else but with me. And I'm old enough and mature enough to know that, and I've been around the bush a few times. I've seen it plenty of people. Um, I know people me, but I have solid friends, and I don't need anything else. Especially Paul. Paul is all I have. You know, I have family and friends. And just don't want anybody else. On August 29th, 2020, Daniel had passed away. He had his last moments. He had a seizure. They gave him a bunch of seizure medicine and basically pulled a plug in when we really didn't want to. Um, so he died. We watched him slowly die. It was horrible to watch him struggle to breathe. Watch his heart rate go completely flat. He died for a few seconds. He got to life. His heart rate shot up to 80. And then for barely, what, 30 seconds, he completely just died. Oh, 
it was the worst day ever. I'm very grateful that I got to witness that. If you look for him, at his last moment, but it definitely scarred me really bad. And I would never wish that on anybody. Not, not even all of my worst enemies. It's truly a hard thing to do. And to be honest, I wish I was still with him. My heart and soul, soul died that day. When he died, my soul died. My heart died. A piece of me went forever gone, and I'll never get that back. My happiness went away. Even though I found happiness was how uh, it kind of my life. But my true, true, true happiness is forever gone. That day, I had lost my husband, my best friend, my soulmate, my twin flame, my one, the one person that you searched your whole life by before, and that you were taught. That's what you find if you keep it and you keep that relationship forever. But nobody taught you what you're supposed to do with that guy. What do you do when it is that? It sucks so bad. And nobody seems to understand. And I always get in the comments of, oh, just move on, you're going to marry again, you're going to have more kids, this and that. But I don't. I don't want that. Like, you don't understand what he meant to me. And what it was like. If you've never met that and had that, you'll never understand at all. Nothing would ever compare to it. You'll just be miserable in other relationships. So, since that day, I don't know a lot of people, but since that day, I into a really deep depression and I kept myself sober for so long. Um, which probably was the hardest part. I never picked up on that bottle. I never drank. I never spent any day. I never... If you know my past, I used to be suicidal. I used to overdose on medication. I used to be an alcoholic at 17. I... I used to try to kill myself, I used to cut myself, I used to do all of it, I used to overdose on medication like I did a lot of it. And we completely sober this all of it. It was fucking hell. Fucking hell. And to lose a lot of people from it, it was horrible. And what sucks was, people that treated us badly, or especially Daniel badly, all of a sudden, I wanted to be part of his life. All of a sudden, because he was dead. All of, he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. This is that. No. It's too late for now. Late for that, you know? So I never understood that. I've tried my hardest to survive you. Crazy problem. I'm very grateful for my mother and Daniel's mom because they've helped me a lot. And some other people have to. That's close to me. But they've. They've really helped a lot. Um, Dana's mom, especially because she's helped provide stuff for Tala. And I've had a really sweet with my family and friends by, and a lot of people, and a lot of support. Even by people I didn't think would ever support me. So I'm grateful for everybody that has helped me. Even though I've shut up. I just shut down and even shut out. I talked to whoever wanted to talk to you. And just listen to me. You really don't want to understand. I thought I understood them for those that couldn't take off for Daniel Spirit. I understand where for those that just have plans and ready to schedule family stuff just never showed up. For those that really do care for that Daniel and I, 
past we showed up. You know, very grateful for all that. Um, I'm very grateful for everybody that's helped me. It still helps me. Because some days I just don't know how we're going to survive. There is days, I'm not going to lie, where I just want to be where Daniel is. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be with him. I don't want to be where he is. And that's the saddest truth. But I survived. For Tala. Because nobody's going to raise him the way we want him to raise. To be raised. I was going to teach him how his father really was and how great of a person he was and who he truly was, you know, the wolf side of him and everything. The DNS and all that stuff, no crazy stuff, all that. You know, was my whole world, my destiny, my life, my everything, my protector. For almost four years, and it's crazy to find that Prince Charming, per se. I don't even know who I am or what to do without him. It's like when you go to a party, and you only know one person there. So you cling to that person, and you follow them everywhere. And then the moment they go to the bathroom or go home, you're like, oh, what do I do in the house? So you just stay in a corner and hope you're going to survive. That's, that's it. It's definitely been hell. Very hell. Not happy with him. And I question myself a lot. Like, question the universe a lot. Why do I deserve this? Why did I deserve losing? My person. Why did this all have to go without having a father? You know, Daryl didn't have a choice with us, and he lost lost a lot of stuff, and didn't have that father relationship that he should have. And Tyler was supposed to have. What do you guys think? So I. I do question a lot of why he got taken because he helped a lot of people. He was truly a good person. I just, I don't understand. I really don't understand why he was allowed to die the way he was die, and it was not a respectful death at all. And it should have, he should have died a way better way. A way better way. That did not deserve. Did not deserve that death at all. Alice sees, sees him all the time. I know he does because he talks about him all the time and he goes, hi, daddy, daddy. And we have friends that see too. He is a friend and all. Top Daniel does finally have his chief headdress. That's the wolf. So he fully is his true Native American. Show myself, which I'm grateful for. I have these gifts and I just don't, I'm so closed off that I don't get to see or hear that people see and hear Daniel and how I'm in his dreams and stuff. I don't get all that. I do get jealous sometimes. I do, and it's hard not to, you know. But I know when the time comes, I'll get that moment with him, like everybody else for the major. I don't even know what to do anymore without him. He was my my true friend. I have best friends. I do. And I have close family and friends. And they told me to serve almost everything. But Daniel was like the number one clean screen. And I told him everything. He was like the ultimate best friend. Not having Daniel is like not having a purpose in my life. Tala saved me. He really did. And he never will know it. Maybe when he gets older, he'll know. But he truly saved me. If it wasn't for Tala, I would not be here. I really wouldn't. Because I'd rather be where, where Daniel is. But nobody would ever love Daniel Tala like we did. 
the whole reason like we was. So, I chose life and stayed. It is the hardest decision I've ever made. It's the not selfish decision I've made. I've always made selfish ones. And this is like the selfless life. Plus, my niece Sophia needs me really bad too. As much as how hard it is for me to stay alive, I am happy. I would have had such amazing time <laughs> if I was dead. So, uh, I have to keep going. I don't have to keep reminding myself that. I have to accomplish our goals that we had. Sam will have a bunch of other dreams and achievements that he has and actually have to achieve that I need to do for him. Like, hopefully at some point do an animal rescue because he always wants to do that. It definitely kills me. It does. I've always have this heaviness in my chest. My chest hurts so bad all the time. I still have panic and anxiety back, especially if I'm at places and I don't have to handle anymore. Because if he, he truly was my protector and I lean on him for everything. They're like, who do I lean on? I'm probably continuing to be if something happens. Like, I have, I don't have anybody. I know I have people, I know I have, I know I do, but it feels like I don't have anybody. And it, and it hurts very, very, very bad. And it hurts not having the close relationships like I used to have. And I know people grow apart, but Daniel's death feels a lot worse there. But I do am grateful for those that have reached out and that's helped me a lot. Even though it's so hard for me to talk, I know it really knows what you're feeling. Except for when I post on Facebook, which doesn't even have all the true feelings or the times that I just don't want to be here. And I'm really proud of myself how so much I've helped myself get through a lot of it. It's for you guys might not seem a big deal about going to grave every Sunday. But to me, it's a big deal and it hurts that nobody really wants to go to the grave with me. With invited open invitations, I have posts on Snapchat and Facebook if anybody wants to come with me. Sometimes I know it's last minute, but it does hurt. And I've had a couple people that I'm grateful for my mom and they was mom that comes with me all the time to the grave. When I do go, and then the few people that came here and there, but it does, it really does hurt me. And the way knows so much, I've cried out for him. You know, I cry out all the time, and I know he's with our baby girl. He's going to help raise her. And I know how he's with her. And I hope one day I can see them too, especially in my dreams. But like I am, but I am trying to find myself again. I know who I am. I know my like I know my old self, and my old self is not really that pretty either. So I'm trying to like repair the old self and this self and be a parent at the exact same time. So, I don't think I'm a good parent a lot of the time, but I'm trying. And that's the only thing I know how to do anymore is to be a mother. And be some kind of guidance to people, because that's always, I've always been, been a mother figure to people, so that's all, I, that's all I know. And it doesn't help that I went through a lot of bullying, and surprise, surprise. It was one of my bridesmaids who showed up super late right when it ended and didn't really do anything. But her and her duty spoke so much weed and shit. So, and I've tried helping them out plenty of times on the channel. They've blackmailed the channel before. So, so big surprise that they always never bullied me. Because they were bullied and you know. And what sucks is, a lot of my friends are still friends with them. And I can't openly 
tell people who I like because I don't need them asking questions and stirring things up since I got everything. Uh, some close friends that got taken care of. And I just don't need that drama to stir it up. So just know the ones that are friends with on my bones, I'm keeping an eye on you. And please don't tell anybody my destiny. For real. It definitely was a hard time breastfeeding while being, having COVID, but also taking care of dogs, taking care of my mother who has COVID, who had COVID too, and taking care, taking care of Kyle who had COVID. Thankfully, we didn't need to go to the hospital, and I refused to go to the hospital, so I'm like, I sure overdose on vitamin C, we're sitting up, we're in a movie, we're doing stuff, and Walking the dogs helped a lot too, because you're supposed to do all that. You can't not rest. Like if you do, you have to do rest. Like it's short periods of time, but you have to be sitting up the whole entire time. So I try to help save other people too with that. With personal advice, because the moment that you lay down, especially on your side and your back, that's when it really gets to you. I truly believe that I could have healed Daniel, and he would have been here still with us. If I never took him to the hospital, but if I'd known that knowledge, I could have saved. Like what I know now, if I knew back then, I could have saved him. I could have saved him from being here, saved him at the house, and he was still be here. Or I could he be at a different hospital that would have saved him with my, especially with my aunt. So. Do I really know how I'm feeling? Just know that I'm, I'm really trying my hardest. And sometimes it doesn't feel like enough. And sometimes it feel like I take it out of our ballot too much. Like, I get so overwhelmed that I get taken out or I get angry. And I know I'm angry a lot because I just, why are we here? We get mad because you lie here to help me with that. And it's so scary to do everything with myself. Even though I have Daniel's mom, I have my mom, I have my sister, I have family and friends that can help me and stuff, but it still feels very lonely. You know, there's people I can call. When I feel like this, I have my pity attack, but I just don't know how to like call or like say I just need an ear or just I don't even know what to say anymore. Or even how to reach out to help. Like, what do I say? Like, hey, I feel like shit. Because everybody, nobody wants to take care of you when you're down because this whole bullshit society thinks that you shouldn't not take care of people that are depressed or really down, that you should take care of yourself just like this old loop, which is freaking bullshit. Like, it's so stupid. And I hate bothering people. I feel like I'm bothering people. It doesn't help with this new society stuff of self-care and everything. It's just so stupid. I wish it was here. I really do, and it's an understatement. But Tala is just his mini me to the T. And I know it's gonna get worse than he gets out. But I know eventually I will be happy for it, I will be grateful for it, and everything, but right now it's just happening so bad. So I'm trying everything I possibly can. So Tala will have all these memories, the photo albums, the YouTube videos, the videos I'm slowly working on that Dan and I have vlogged. Like, we're working all these videos, this whole movie for Tala. And I, as he gets older, so you can see all of it, hear all of it. So, and I do want to get a video together where everybody talks about Daniel and the memories of Daniel. So I need to get that worked on at some point, but I do 
uh, everything's screenshotted that I said the before I'll post them. So I have that. It's just, I don't want to forget any of it either. So that's why I'm working so hard to try to do all of it. Even though it's so painful. And I relive it all the time. And then I get clients that come in with similar stories. They almost died because of medical staff or they don't, or their family members died because of medical staff. And then I get to relive all that because then they ask about Daniel. Because they see his card all the time. And that's my fault for having it there, but I love that Boral place for him. Excuse me, I'll be bored now. So. Now if I know it's my secret, and what it was like, it was pure hell. And I know people have told me that it's all my fault, and that I put Dana in hell, and that I gave myself hell, and I do put Paul in hell and stuff. But you know what? Fuck you. Because... We're not going to hell. He is not going to hell. He is a guidance counselor, he's a spirit guide for people, and he's doing amazing, and he's healing people. And I know that for a fact, because I know people that see him, and see that he does that, he's all the time. And I know for a fact that I'm going to be reincarnated into a spirit guide, because I was told that as a medium, and, that's, and I know it for a fact in my heart, because I've had dreams for spirit guides and a dream princess, and I was in and they were teaching me stuff to bring them. We spiritually, metaphysical, we are amazing people. We are all going to be spirit guides at some point. Tal is going to be a spirit guide because of who he, whose parents are. So. Please look forward to the last part of this video of me talking about Tano and describing him. Tano's name was Tano Joseph Gonzalez. His native name was my counsel though, which means wolf walker, or in other words, aka skin walker. He truly believed in his Native American past and ancestry, so he learned from his grandmother the shaman way in his old Native American past. So he definitely practiced that. Um, he taught me more Native American. As I knew, because I do have some, but we have different ones. So it's nice to be able to learn about that, but also about the um, Hispanic culture and other cultures too as well. We both got to teach each other's culture, so it was really cool. Um, she was, she went in with through a couple of abusive relationships before. I got to change his world and show what real love really was about and what unconditional love. He was only 23, but he acted, okay, he did act like a child sometimes, but I think all of us do, even I do, but he was very mature for his age, which I always thought he was older, never knew he was younger. And so he had talked about graduating and stuff and told me to be here. And I'm like, what? Well, that was an eye opener. <laughs> he loved making people happy and feel good about themselves. So he was definitely a huge flirt and it's, like he truly wanted people to feel good. So he used, so he was, if you were a guy, if you were a girl, like he would flirt just to make you feel better. Especially if you knew you were a girl. He even did that with strangers too. Bugged me a lot. That bothered me a lot. But I learned to let go because it was his way of making people feel happy and feeling good about themselves. So I I dealt with it. <laughs> I dealt with it. <laughs> his 
dreams were bigger than we could ever achieve. And I think that's everybody. We have these such high, big goals and dreams that may not be achievable. But he was so determined to achieve them. He was a huge teddy bear despite his giant height. And that's what I loved. He gave the best hugs, but he also can practice time really well. He absolutely loves wool, which goes well with his name since he is a wolf walker, which we do sometimes be wolf and so you, in the dreams too, so I know I, I see him, but not the way that I want to. Um, he loved to howl all the time, especially when they're like a full dude. And the crazy part is Pala does it. So it's amazing to see all the treats that Pala has that he didn't, he never saw or remembered Daniel doing. So it's really cool. And you know, Pala's seen that they will, is a wolf. So he definitely is a wolf walker and heart fairy. Um, Daniel loves, loves purple. But also, he loved the smell of lavender and myrrh. It was like his favorite, and dragon blood. He used to buy the lavender, um, the myrrh resin and burn it, and that used to kill me all the time. <laughs> because I'm asthmatic, and the strong was just way too strong for me. Um, he was very spiritual. He was not religious. He grew up in the church, but he got into his true calling, which was with his Native American culture. He did believe in God, but he also believed in a mother, earth, a goddess like we do, and he believed in the Egyptian gods and goddesses, so he had a very, like, similar beliefs like I did, and I still do. So we were very, very spiritual, and we learned all different cultures, including the ones that we're from and have in our blood and our ancestry. But also, we didn't believe in a religion, per se. We believe there is a path, and everybody has their own path and belief system, so not, er not everything should be categorized or boxed in, or how, look how things are, you know. So we were very, very, very spiritual, and definitely practiced the Native American culture a lot. He was definitely a fighter, but he was a protector and would help anyone. He would fight bullies, which he used to tell me all the time. When he was in high school and middle school, but he used to beat up the boys. So if he needed help, he, he was a person to go to, and he definitely beat up some people for me <laughs> or stood up for me. And I don't have him. I don't know what I'm going to do, especially with my landlord thinking he owns me because they don't want here anymore, which really scares me. He had a very huge heart. Despite all the pain he went through from not having, from the family life that he endured, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in to that, and the friendships he had endured and all the abuse that he had gone through with relationships, he had a, a really big, huge heart like me. He was very, 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 very caring. He definitely matured a lot, a lot more and really grew into the man that he was meant to be with me. And I was, I'm very grateful that I got the help with that too. And just like really help him become the first man of the man that he was meant to be. Um, his smile could light up a whole room. You could be having a, a bad day. The moment that boy smiles and laughs, it will just light, light up your own your your room and your smile. I need this to smile so much in his life. Like I can use some right now. And he has such high wisdom for his age. Even though he could be immature a lot, but he did have really good wisdom, which definitely comes from that many Southern American roots. He definitely loved his son. He loved Silas so much tonight, and I know he talked about it all the time. He was such an amazing dad. He really was. 
you know, wish I was able to fully, was fully able to experience that, but not the way I'm going to have to teach them. Oh, I really wish we got to do our Halloween wedding because we were, he was very excited for it and he was planning it, not me. Like, he told me that the wedding's for me and I was trying to plan it, but he, it was for him. It really was. <laughs> he had very high, high dreams and goals for the wedding. And I think it was way more of a budget than we could ever afford. And I, Instead, I had a great wedding, and he was there with the help of a friend that's a medium. We were able to say our vows at the grave, which most people are not going to understand. Um, so very grateful that the few close people that were there were there, because I wouldn't want anybody else. Um, definitely was us, because we're super spooky people, and believe in ghosts and all that, so it definitely was something that we would probably have done. It definitely was us. Um, there is a video from that, so instead of making it public, because I'm afraid of the backlash and the negativity from it, I have it listed as a link only, so if I give you a link, you can watch it. So if anybody really is truly understand it and really wants to watch that video, just please private message me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Cause it's not, not meant for everybody. Nobody's really, got, not a lot of people will understand it, but, or just understand the spiritual goal side of me. But I married a ghost and I'm proud to say that. Um, the mouth that he said back really through our friend was something that he would say. So I know it truly was him. Um, but please, no hate on that at all. Because I am still trying to change my last name to his last name because that's all I want is my last name to be unvalid. I don't want any other last name, and I don't even really want my last name either. He loved weapons. Especially nice and gotten, but he knew like he got really excited for knives, and he always looked at them everywhere we go. And as long as the store has it, he's lucky. He knew everything about vapes and was trying to educate educate people the proper way of using vapes and the um, proper healthy ways and the ways that you should be able to quit because maybe it should be only a short period of time, not like a long time. Just enough to where it gets you to where you stop quit smoking. So he was really using his, because he used to be a smoker at such a young, in a teenage years. So he was able to use vaping to get past, past that. So he actually was, when you see him vape, it was out of zero nicotine. Once in a while he went up a little, he was stressed out. A lot of time it was just to create smoke because he liked big smoke and doing cool tricks with it. So that's all it was. But he really did a lot of research. He, outside of work, he was watching videos on Gates and Juices and all that stuff. So he really wanted to tell you what brands are good for you and what brands are bad for you. Because a lot of the gas stations are, are what's giving Gates a bad rep. So don't buy it from a gas station. Go to an actual vape shop that knows their shit. Um, he loved walking and loved showing parts of his life, but he was also afraid of stalkers and all that, because a lot of bloggers do get that and, you know, break his tooth. So he wanted to share parts of his life, but not all of it. And he truly, truly loved vlogging, even though he stopped and got out of it for a while. He didn't talk to a lot of people, especially family that did him wrong or abandoned him, which... He never forgave any of them. And I made, and he made sure to promise him <laughs> a long time ago that I would not talk to any of them or be associated with them. So, try to remember all that and which family and friends is the fun part. But, I'll get there. I'll, I'll use my gut feeling. Um, but he learned really quick to have a 
a small circle. Um, I know he never wanted to be in a swimming pool, put power in a swimming pool that he was in growing up, especially not having a father figure, and the father figure he had was with his favorite, favorite pastor, and I'm very grateful for him, and Daniel talked, and had talked so highly of him, and he definitely saved him. His best friend, ultimate best friend, was, was his best friend, Brian, which is an amazing person, and I know he'll take his top degree, like, to the max, but he'll be a really good person and a good cop for that. He, he just really is an amazing person and so punches out for talent. I saw this is his wife, Leah. So I'm grateful for them. Um, screaming at him, the faith job was his life. It really was. And it was his ultimate favorite thing. He put his heart and soul to all to them. And he would do anything for them. His pride and joy was the stupid dog Charter and Johnny Depp. Like, that's ultimate favorite. Like, I've always talked about how he's just going to leave me for Johnny Depp or he's going to leave me for his car, even though the funny part was his car got <laughs> so <laughs> So he couldn't. He even cried about that car all the time. Even, like, when we got our car together, which was our first car we ever got together and ever owned. Oh, well, we don't even own it. It's just being rent. For renting, basically, the lease, but we've never done before, or with anybody else. So it was really cool that we got to be our first. Um, I always tease him about that. He loved teasing me and getting it on my nerves. I was maybe so fiery, so I guess he loved that, and I missed his. Stupid, inappropriate, bad jokes, and all the inappropriate jokes he used to say, or the memes he used to send to me. Like, I didn't think I would miss any of that. And I always thought that was annoying. And now I miss all the annoying stuff. I miss all of that stuff. And it's like, because it's, I know some people have so many bad jokes in their life, but it's not the same. But I do appreciate the bad jokes. But it's not not as good as Daniel does sometimes. He definitely wanted to be fully tattooed, like he wanted to be covered in a tattoo, and I know he had plans for our tattoo on it. Like he wanted a full body suit of just different things that he had loved and really wanted, especially Egyptian, because that was, he loved Egyptian. I love Asia, he loved it, Egypt. <laughs> so definitely was a thing. And I'm really sad that he never got to do all of that. And he was, but I am happy that he did got his first tattoo. And it was his magician. So I'm really happy that he was able to get that and bring that with him to his afterlife. No matter what I do, he always supported me with everything. He supported my business. He was my number one fan for everything. Um, I used to be able to practice his hair, on his hair. I could do whatever I wanted to his hair. And he used to tell me stuff he wanted to do. Like, I could never do spider braids. And he wanted the spider braids and the fancy braids. Or he wanted silver hair and this and that. So I tried my best to give him what he had wanted. And I tried to support his dreams and goals that he really wanted to. So we were very supportive of each other. And we, we definitely tried our hardest. Talking. Oh my god. That was one of his favorite chips ever. He loves those things, even though it was horrible for his liver. And Modelo's were his favorite beer. Uh, Devin loved tequila. And he used to help me with my Spanish because I did grow up with friends that had spoken, it, but it said go long and I just don't remember all of it. And he always says I have a white girl accent, and he used to tease me for it. So <laughs> I used to get so mad, and I just like, I ain't doing Spanish anymore. You're just gonna keep teasing me. So I definitely been teaching all of Spanish, but also I've been learning it too. So hopefully, all my Spanish-speaking friends and family can help me. Definitely, I know Daniel will help me 
to Sal a lot, and I definitely am looking forward to learning that. But Sal is going to be very confused because I know Korean and Korean, Japanese, and other Asian and Chinese and all that stuff. But we still learn a lot of different languages, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be very confused. <laughs> but it's okay. I think that makes that's why I'm very well rounded because I've learned different. Um, cultures and I've learned different languages because I want to be able to connect with everybody and have people so like so I understand them. So that's why I do that too. Gosh. Daniel loves video games. He plays that all the time. And there's certain YouTubers that he loves very, very, very much. Like um Dex Gapsikai, which I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And Jelly and the crew. Um, and then he also loves, um, crap, what is it? I used to watch it with him too. Cause he has the, um, Pokemon song. God damn it, I forgot what I'm gonna name. <laughs> and then he got me into KK and Baby J, which is a family friendly YouTube channel. And then he also loves some other family, family friendly ones, including the ranch guy that has the guns with talk to love him too, but he definitely loved watching vloggers and YouTube families and all that. And he wanted that for us too as well. Um, I really do hope he loves his heartbeat tattoo and his face on me. Well, his two sided, his double personality. Daniel was bipolar. Had depression and anxiety, and he was learning how to cope with all that because he's just used to being angry all the time. So I was definitely was trying to help with that as much as he allowed me to. Having him open up is was the hard part, and getting him to talk. So that was hard, but I did took my time and made sure it was very, very, very loved, and he knew that, and then he could talk to me about anything. Anything stupid too, because I used to tell him like the stupidest things. They're like, oh my goodness, what's this color in there? It's just, so you know, it's like, it just talks to me about anything. Doesn't matter how personal <laughs> I get. Like, definitely made sure that he was very loved and that he could open up to me, which I know sometimes was very, 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 very hard. And I'm, I'm told, I don't want to say talk, but I told him that. With me, writing is easier for me to express my feelings, but we were learning different ways of expressing our feelings, so he definitely picked up writing a lot. But sometimes it takes a lot to be able to do that, so I'm hoping I did something. <laughs> I don't know if I did anything right or anything, but I hope I did, and I hope he truly knows how much I loved him. And I know with the vows, he talked about it and how I saved him and everything. And how I made him truly feel very loved, but I really hope he does. And I do wish I wasn't so hard or stubborn a lot of the time. And I know you're not supposed to think about that stuff, but I do. Besides the good stuff and all of our fun adventures, I'll be to you. Uh, we had a lot of plans that we wanted to do, and there's a lot of stuff I wasn't able to take up to you or show you or vice versa. And I know I can do that with Paula, but it's not going to be the same. But I'm going to try my hardest to do that. So, definitely. Paula doesn't replace Daniel, but I'm definitely try to have Daniel lift the product, if that makes sense. So I'll take Paula to Dinosaur World like I'm supposed to take Candle and take them to all these restaurants or places that I wanted to keep them. When Tyler gets old enough, he's going to take Con Con with me at the Korean convention. So if anybody left Korea or in Asia and want to go with us, we'll we're planning a trip when he gets older. I think he has to be five when he can tell the last class in concert. To be honest, I probably write a book about everything that came to left. And so if anybody ever has questions or you want to know more about Daniel, I don't mind talking. I might cry, but I don't mind. 
we finally went to the beach together for the very first time, which was very shocking. Um, last summer was Tala, which was Tala's first time. Um, I don't even know what else to say about the animals and stuff, but he loved a lot of things. And he, generally, he was a really good person and really tried to help people out. And we've always kept snacks and waters in our trunk just in case the people needed it when we were out and about, especially dogs and animals. We definitely tried help a lot of people. We had a lot of plans. Um, I really was playing with his hair and the teasing and stuff. And it's all annoying things and I never thought I would. So if you ever get annoyed, just enjoy it. <laughs> just enjoy it because you're going to miss it one day. And I promise you, you will miss the annoying things. I don't know if I'll ever write an autobiography about him, but I definitely might write a, maybe one day I'll write a book about him. Maybe I'll just post like, have pictures and write about memories with the pictures and stuff. Um, but for now, this video is probably really long and I'm very sorry for, thank you for whoever is listening to me. Thank you for making it this high. I might not know everything about him or his past. I know something, and I definitely know that he loved his mom very deeply and was trying to be in a good position to be able to forever take care of her, and he wanted to right the wrongs that he done, like, she had worked, like, three, four jobs, there was five boys, like, he never understood it at the time, so he ended up dropping out of high school, and moving in with his best friend and then he really really realized how much work and how much love she was trying to put in that might not seem like it at that time and so he he learned a lot and realized a lot so he felt very 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 sorry from the troubles and the worries that he put on her so he really wanted to take care of her and really deepen that relationship with her um she was the number one. Her before me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm okay with that. I've always told her, like, she will always be number one and I will be number second. So, and I'm okay with that. And I'm trying to keep that promise of taking care of her. And I know she's trying to take, keep her promise of taking care of me. So we'll try to take care of each other. I allowed him to be whoever he wanted to be. And he got to. Be freely open and really got to be who he wanted to be and what he was. He had no restrictions, no bounds. Like, you know how with certain people you could be your true self and something you couldn't be? He was able to do that with me and I very helped him a lot with that. He did have a wolf spirit in him. He did act like a wolf, <laughs> as some of you know. Um, but I got it truly got to me that wolf side and I got to tame that, that side of him and I got to train it and really basically I got to the chaos that was inside of him and I got to help him work through it and tame it to where it became something beautiful and nobody was ever able to do that he definitely had a beautiful caring soul even the wolf was very scary. He just needed some training and obedience from a fairy. <laughs> so I definitely was able to do that. There's no doubt in my mind that he knows how much I love him, even though I doubt it all the time. And sometimes I question if he ever loves me, but I think that's part of the grief process, you know. I definitely went through the spouts here and there. I want to question if he ever loves me. He definitely has. And it was so horrible to even, to, to even doubt. It was him not being here. It makes it even worse. Kids were like, well, I guess you don't love you. Because I don't see you. I don't hear you. You're not in my dreams like everybody else is too. Because some people see him and hear him and stuff. So you're like, well, I guess you don't love me. 
then he sends Spotify to me, he sends animals, like, he sends messages, but in not in the way that I want it to be, because <laughs> I just want to see him and hear him. And sometimes he, um, his cologne will randomly appear in a place I should have never been there. So I know it's him. Um, I know he loves Tyler very much too. He loves his dogs and my dogs and our cat. He loves them so much and he's hooking them in. He took my niece in and loved her and she was like a daughter as well. And still will forever be like a daughter. Um, he loved her. He even took my sister in even when she hated him and made his life hell. He took her in and she became the sister that he wished he had. Even though he has half sisters, but he doesn't have a relationship with them at all. So he truly did love her through everything and it was a um, sweet and sour patch kids kind of relationship. <laughs> but once she got to know him, they got to know each other. They truly do love each other and not like brothers and sisters. I know he will always be watching over us. And, but I can't help feeling alone and wishing to see him and help raise Tyler, but I know he's right there. I know he's a chief now in his spirit for him. He has a beautiful wolf headdress and still helping those who need it. I know all that. And I know that our next relationship is being in me. He's a spirit and I'm the earth, the physical and all he's the spiritual. And even though it may seem like I'm alone on TV, I know he's right there with me on those things. Unless he's to me up and I'll never know. <laughs> I'll never know. But, um, if you hear me talk about dating and marrying a ghost, just know I really am and I haven't lost my mind. It's just my way of coping. Besides making calls of his, um, his butcher character. We had, we had a beautiful life together. I, I promise you, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, the words missing you will never be enough. Never ever. As much it kills me, but I look forward to our next chapter. I'm the physical while you're the spiritual. The yin to my yang, the wolf to my fairy. And I'm definitely not afraid to say I'm married to spirit because I already looked into the law. And you can't bury a dead body. So the next best thing is trying to change my last name, which I'm really confused on the paperwork. And I really do need an attorney to help me, but I can't afford that right now. So I'm going to have to wait. I definitely hope you come along to my Tal estate. I hope you follow us and you help me raise talent. Which I know you're probably going to get him in a lot of trouble. Because <laughs> he's been doing stuff that he should have never known about, which I know it's from you. Or say things that I know it's from you. I'm crazy and weird already, so I might as well embrace it. And this is our real, this, we have a weird relationship anyways. We love the spooky stuff. We love all that. So I know this is us. And our next our next chapter, and I know a lot of people aren't going to understand, and everybody's going to think I'm crazy and stupid and stuff, and that's fine, because I already get called out all the time anyways, even before you, so, so we're weird, that's winky guys, uh, see, I'm a multi-meal boy, I promise I'm going to teach how Spanish about you and everything we agreed on. I wish I could speak some beautiful Spanish to you, but I only know a little bit. And I have a white girl accent. That's something. They always butcher in Spanish all the time, so I'll try some more Hispanic. <laughs> so I see you again. Physical, we're with you finally. Do you all of you beat us? Do a school song. And I probably just butcher that last part. <laughs> Thank you guys for whoever's listening and watching. I hope you cried with me. But thank you, thank you very much. And please, no, don't make it a comment. Only positive.
or don't have it at all. So thank you, Westwood. And this is our story. Three, midway on three. One, two, three. Midway! midway!